talk a little bit about uh, functional assessment. And you should have probably three questions in your mind. What is it? Why do I need it? And how do I do it? And I'm going to cover those topics in the context of joint motion uh, preservation devices, arthroplasty, joint fusion, and fracture, fix uh, fracture fixation. Is this too loud? So first, what is functional assessment, or in our case, functional biomechanical assessment? So this is the evaluation of how well an implant meets its design objectives. So designed by the engineer or the doctor, how well does this product or system meet those objectives? And how well does it meet the objectives when it's implanted in the biological environment? So, you're, you know, a lot of you are probably thinking, you know, I've, I've done my testing at Empirical, you know, my ASTM, my SO, FDA's happy, why do I need to do this? It's one more step. So, the answer to that is, you know, in the product development field, you want to find out if your design or your idea is a winner soon before you spend a ton of money. So, you want to fail early and fail cheap and move on to the next idea, okay? So this kind of type of testing identifies those characteristics in your device that uh, meet uh, the design objectives. It, it helps um, distinguish it from other products on the market, which is what the surgeon is interested in. How can you make my life easier or make the patient's life easier? Uh, in addition, it helps provide information for design improvements on your product uh, or potentially new products. So exactly how is this functional assessment performed? Well, typically it's performed in the laboratory. It's done on either experiments on cadaver specimens using math models or computer models or on animal models or any combination of the above to achieve the goals. So these are just a few things worked on. we worked on in the past year or two. So in the world of uh, motion restoration uh, or arthroplasty, what do we want to measure? What's important? Well, typically the first thing that people think up is range of motion. How much motion do I, do I put back into the system in a degenerative level or degenerative joint? Uh, the second thing is that quality of that motion or the kinematic signature. We're also interested in the, uh, the implant bone motion. Is there any toggling, uh, something in the future that'll cause a problem, uh, non-fusion, subsidence? And finally, we want to look at the load sharing at that implanted joint between the implant and the bone in the context of stress shielding. It's very important, especially in hip. So, we're looking at a uh, total disc replacement experiment for uh, cervical arthroplasty. This is a uh, schematic on the left showing uh, total disc uh, art uh, arthroplasty at C56. And on the right, we can see the experiment. Behind all of that equipment is the uh, cadaveric spine. We have the motion measurement uh, optoelectronic sensors backed up by a C arm. It's a C arm allows us to see the uh, motion or the toggle between the implant and the bone, so that's critical. So this is a quick animation of this C56 arthroplasty, and you're looking at the, the kinematic signature on the right, so we can see the range of motion, and you can see what we think is the, the quality of motion as we run through this video. So you can see that uh, the device moves, uh, it moves a considerable distance. What I don't have is the intact to compare it to, but our specimens are not always young and healthy. So you gotta use that in, in context when you're testing. So this is typical data that would come out of this type of testing. You get range of motion. In this case, we're looking at uh, flexion extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation range of motion before and after uh, arthroplasty. So you can compare um, 
pre and post, in this case, and in most cases of cervical arthroplasty, you tend to restore flexion extension range of motion, but not necessarily lateral bending and rotation. So I mentioned quality of motion. We look quality of motion is uh, you know stiffness of the, the spine and the different postures, hysteresis, but also center of rotation is quality of motion. In this case, we're looking at that same C56 arthroplasty, and we're looking at that center of rotation um, before arthroplasty and after. And what you can see is the AP position is pretty close. Uh, cranial caudal, we're a little more cranial now after arthroplasty, but we've also added a considerable amount of disc height. Nice. You agree. So we're looking at uh, joint fusion um, implants. So what's, what's our goal? We're, you know, we're, we're trying to diffuse that. We're trying to increase the, the stability of the joint, remove motion, and typically we want to do this under physiologic loads or in worst case uh, conditions, worst case scenarios, so we can make sure that these products actually function uh, when the patient goes home and we're not paying attention to them. So we're also looking at interface motion between the, the plate or the screw or the cage and the bone. And ideally you want to compare this to some sort of a gold standard if there is one. Okay, now we get to the cool part. Less words. So in a, in a wrist uh, biomechanic assessment, we could be looking at fusion here, we could be looking at arthroplasty. I would play that again if I could. Uh, this is an experiment looking at the uh, scaphalunate joint. And so here we go. And so we're looking at the dart thrower's motion, which is combined extension radial deviation to combined flexion and ulnar deviation. So in this case, a worst case scenario on a wrist experiment like this may be applying uh, loads to the tendons, flexors and extensors. So that's in a later video that I don't have with me. So you have to use your imaginations. So if we're looking at fracture fixation, you know, what's important in this case? Well, it's very similar to fusion. So we're looking at uh, stability of that uh, fracture. We're going to do it under physiologic loads again, worst case conditions, and ideally in comparison to some gold standard if there is one or something that the, the, the uh, surgeon is most comfortable with. So in this context, we're looking at the extend extended trochanteric osteotomy uh, for revision hip. So we're comparing two different types of fixation, uh, three cerclage wires versus two wires and a distal plate. So when we're testing this type of a setup, we want to do this under somewhat of a realistic scenario. So on the picture on the left, you can see that we're applying a compressive force on the joint, on the ball. Uh, mimicking the body weight, and we're also applying uh, tendon loads uh, mimicking the muscle forces. So it, in ratios that are relevant to uh, normal gait, standing posture. Okay, so everything I talked about before was the normal sort of standard of care in functional assessment, biomechanical functional assessment. So what I'm moving on to now is sort of the, the future or what things are going to move to, what we hope they, they move to. So this is an advanced uh, technology looking at specimen specific kinematics. So initially I'm going to talk about spine, but then we'll branch off when you're not paying attention and talk about other things. So specimen specific kinematics, what that is, it's, a, it's sort of a marriage of a CT scan, a specimen specific CT scan and reconstruction. We're going to combine that or marry that with that specimen's own kinematic data. So a CT scan on the specimen, we go to the lab, we collect kinematic data, we combine the two, and what that does is it allows you to see the CT scan in motion, so it's playing back the kinematic data that was collected on the same specimen. 
But since this is done in the computer now, since we combine the data in the computer, we can slice and dice the anatomy, the bones. And in this case, we're looking from inside of the canal out at the foraminal dimension or foraminal area. This is a quantitative measure, as you can see on the graph. And we can do other really cool things. Uh, in the, if we're looking at a cervical arthroplasty, it's very common for cervical arthroplasties to have, to behave a little different than the native disc. And what that does is it changes the way the facets work, how they overlap and align. Uh, it's common for uh, facet issues to arrive in the future after arthroplasty. So this kind of technology allows you to look at how the facets, the facet overlap changes, how the opposition changes. Okay, so we're moving on to hip. So in a hip, you may look, at, you want to look at maybe inter intra-articular motion. Uh, we're looking at, in this case, uh, femoral acetabular impingement. You can look at, uh, you know, effect of articular damage and labral tears. So if you look at the arrow, you can see the effect. When you have enough rotation, you get a little bit of cam out right about there at the end. I think it shows up best on the third cycle. On the right uh, video, you can see that we've cut the bone in half digitally, so we're looking inside of the joint. Last thing I'm going to show you, this is some data we collected last Friday. Um, I think the full experiment came together at about 4 o'clock, and within an hour we had these videos running. So this is the specimen that you see on the right, all the hardware attached to it, all the sensors. We instrumented 10 different bones. I've got a lot of videos, but what I'm showing you here is just relevant to ankle arthroplasty. We're seeing, the, in this case, the intact motion being played back on this specimen's own uh, CT scan, a reconstructed CT scan. So we're looking at the, the medial view and the posterior view, and you can, so it, you can clearly see how the native anatomy functions. So the goal is, if you have an arthroplasty device, your arthroplasty should mimic the natural kinematics. And that way, you won't be uh, adding uh, additional stress to the adjacent, maybe talonavicular joint, for example. So, in summary, this kind of testing is complementary to ASTM. It's not instead of, certainly. Uh, it helps you find you know, the distinguishing characteristics of this design. Uh, to find out how it functions and how it differs from other products on the market. Perhaps how you can improve it. Um, you know, these are things that the, the surgeon is very interested in. How, how can it improve my life and the patient's outcome? That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for our area discussion. With regard to the knee, uh, do you, when you create these testing devices, do you consider, for example, Andriachi's uh, six axes of motion? I mean, do you, you must analyze each joint as a unique hinge apparatus or screw home or whatever in order to accrue the meaningful data? Is that the, the approach? Thank you. Certainly, every joint in the body is very different. You know, the upper cervical spines work works very different than the lower cervical spine. Even uh, the knee is very complex. Um, shoulder, very similarly, very complex. If we're going to do this kind of experiment, you're right. We need to account for all of those variables, all the, you know, the six axes of freedom. Um, we have done knee projects in the fa in the past, but we have not done it using this technology. It'd be something we would love to do given the right circumstances. Hi. <laughs> um, in the picture where the femur was half digitally, do you take into consideration the bone density distribution? And does that affect the mechanics, the mechanical simulation at all? 
Uh, we don't. Um, when we make, when we take the CT scan, we simply make a, a solid body out of it. So we don't account for uh, bone mineral density or internal characteristics of the bone. Good question. Uh, it may be very relevant for uh, high compression studies, yeah, compressive load studies.